Rob Martinsburg, the Zimbabwe, Michael Horgan! I never, I never get old, never get tired of that uh, open. Good morning, welcome to Wednesday with uh, Mike Hornby on Eastern Panhandle Talk. Uh, my co-host today, Mr. Bill Stubblefield. Welcome again. Good morning, uh, uh, Mike. I was going. To, Maria is going to introduce just a second, but before that, can you imagine our introduction if Mike had put had put them together? I, I and, don't. Uh, we're right now. We're benign. We just say <laughs> Bill and Maria. That's right. We don't have any. We don't have the flair that Mike's. Uh, you know, we is. do not, and that is indeed a great intro. And how long do you have to be here to get an intro? Like, oh, I guess you got to own the you station. Got, you you got to be able to run the, the board and, okay. and mess it up. To, okay. to get that kind of intro. <laughs> yeah. Rob spent a lot of time on that. But yes, my fellow co-host <laughs> and my previous boss way back when. No. <laughs> um, Stop. I remember sitting in a room with her and and shaking visibly because I was asking her for, for a story in the, in the journal. And I happened to be working in the journal. <laughs> and this lady sitting on the throne yeah. towering over me it was pretty uh, threatening and, and you realize she was towering over you as yeah. well she, did you so she she made you the man that you are today essentially yeah, yeah. scared oh, scared of women yeah. stop 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 <laughs> but accurate no i'm kidding. <laughs> um welcome into wednesday we're uh we're halfway through the week rob will be back on Monday, so don't Thank panic. Thank God, don't, right? Don't panic, people. Um, <laughs> well, we're not supposed to say that, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Mike says that. We're not supposed to no, say that. No, I was... Uh, okay. You've done a great job. <laughs> I've You tried. have done a great job. All I can do is try. Um, I do want to introduce our next guest. Um, she, joining us via phone, Kathy Hess-Kraus. Kathy is a fellow delegate. Um, Kathy, can you hear us? I sure can. And I would just like to say... I want an intro like that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay a lot of money, Kathy. <laughs> All right, never mind. I'll skip the intro. It, it helps when you sign the paycheck when, when when he comes to you and says, "Hey, what kind of intro do you want?" And you kind of give him what you think, and he goes, "Okay, I'll do that." <laughs> oh, that that was an awesome intro. <laughs> I use it. Once a year for a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once a year or for a week. Or twice a year. I think he takes two, two, two full weeks. <laughs> Kathy, give us, uh, um, obviously, we, we brought you on to talk about uh, homeschooling and things, but give us a, a sense of some of the legislation that you've done for homeschooling in, in the past, and then we can kind of look to moving forward. Well, um, well, one last year we opened up sports access a little bit more so for homeschoolers, Hope Scholarship uh, recipients, private school students, um, so they could participate in sports and get that socialization that everybody says that they feel that homeschoolers need. Um, so we did get that opened up a little bit more than what it previously had been, and that had just homeschoolers had just been allowed to play school sports over the last couple years so that was a big step um last year i did try changing the homeschool law a little bit um opening up some additional testing methods that could be done uh that ended up that died over in the senate though um and i'll be working on that one again this coming session and then over the years we have updated our homeschooling law before i got in i helped lobby to uh to um, modernize our homeschooling law and bring it a little bit closer to what the rest of the u.s does we're we'll, we're still one of the most heavily regulated states though so give us a little background. Are you, are you a homeschooler? Why did you choose to homeschool? And, and, and how has that worked out for your kids? Uh, well, it starts out that um, my kids started school back in, uh, let me think, 92, maybe. I think my first child went to public school. I had children in the public school system for 18 years. And um, at the time, my fourth child was in kindergarten, and my fifth child was in a, her first year of preschool. And we had an issue with our kindergarten teacher and the teacher's aide. They were bullying the whole kindergarten class, verbally abusing them. I had them on audio tape for three weeks. 
school board gave them a year's paid vacation and put them back in the school the next year. And that was the day I started homeschooling and never returned. So I've homeschooled for the last 14 years. And, um, and have I you actually the- done the teaching yourself then, Kathy? Yes, okay. I sure have. Um, I've directed their education in every every way possible. Um, my son, my fourth child, my son graduated two years ago, and my daughter just graduated this year. So I am completely done with my homeschooling. But during that time, um, I began a Facebook group called the Unsocialized Homeschoolers of West Virginia because everybody always said our kids were so unsocialized and. We had so many things going on that it seems like that's all my kids did do was socialize. And I wanted to put that out there so homeschoolers could find activities that were going on, classes and all that. And I've been running that now for, I think, 12 years. Um, Then I was president of West Virginia Home Educators. And I stepped down from that position when I was appointed as a delegate three years ago. And that's the position that uh, Roy Ramey has right now? Is that Correct. correct? Okay. He was my vice president when I left, and the position moved on to him, and he's been reelected into that position. Bill? Uh, Good morning, Kathy. Bill Stubblefield. Uh, I have not had experience with homeschooling. I, like most folks, have good friends who have homeschooled with with uh, quite quite successful doing it. Uh, But I see homeschooling like so much of our society today has become polarized. Uh, There's the two camps, either firmly in support of homeschooling and those that challenge it. What I see among the homeschoolers, though, is a attitude of being overly defensive, that we're doing it right, you do not appreciate what we're doing, uh, and you're, you've taken, I say you, this is a euphemistic you, taken the approach that it's unfair to challenge any aspect. Well, like in everything, there's mostly good and some bad. How can you address the bad if you have a defensive posture like a lot of folks with homeschooling do have? Well, one, there's already laws out there for those bad actors. The school boards or CPS just need to follow those laws and go through with them. And they can address those bad actors that are within the homeschool community. And there's those, those same ones are within the public school community also. Um, you know, we are on the defensive because we have always been put on the defensive. That homeschooling was bad. It was, uh, you know, your kids were unsocialized. Your kids couldn't go to college. They wouldn't make it in the world. You name it, homeschoolers have been told that. And all of that is completely untrue, and we've had to stay on the defensive to prove those points. And our children are quite successful. Um, Across the board, they're successful. So, you know, I believe the laws that are on the book, if on the books, if, if the agencies would just abide by those laws and follow through on them, they can address any issues that come up. So, Kathy, good morning. This is Maria. Um, So, question, there is some um, structure that that um, that goes along with homeschooling, correct? I mean, you need to turn in or, and I apologize for not knowing all of the, the basics, but is it every three years your child needs to test or how does that work? And, and, you know, do people abide by that? And then who's accountable um, if they do or do not? Yes, so, um, and and I wrote a book that covers all of this for West Virginia homeschooling, and I'm happy to pass it on to anybody who needs to learn or wants to learn more about it. But our kids, um, in the law, it states that they have to be assessed every single year. That assessment can either be a portfolio review or standardized testing. It's up to the parents on which ones they do, which one they choose. Um, and each child is different, so you know it's it's up to what's gonna what's gonna work best with the child. So they have to do that every single year, and then they have to keep those results in their files for three years. And then for grades three, five, eight, and eleven, they have to turn a copy of those years in during that at the end of that school year by June thirtieth. 
Um, and like I said, we're one of the more heavily regulated states. 31 states have no assessments whatsoever. 12 states have assessments and submissions, and that's where we stand. And then seven states have assessments with no submissions. So we are one of the more heavily regulated states. Is that good from your perspective? No, I don't think so. Why not? Um, homeschoolers, we have pulled out of the public school system. We, uh, we don't want anything to do with it. We, we do our own thing. Our kids learn great. They, they are very productive. They're, um, they go to college. They have great, great work habits. You name it. Our kids are, they, they do it. We are, homeschoolers think outside the box. They well, me, do what works best for their kids. Let me interrupt um, very quickly, just a second. So. To me, that sounded like, very much like a defensive statement. You covered everybody under the same paintbrush. Everybody was the better than normal. Everybody was much better than any other students. Uh, that's obviously not the case. There are exceptions. So you, you're sounding defensive in that case by grouping everybody as being nearly perfect. No, nobody's perfect, um, but our parents know what they're doing, and they do it. Um, yes, like I said, there are bad actors out there, and there are laws on the books to cover them. We have one in the homeschooling, in the homeschooling code itself that it states if for any reason the county superintendent thinks that there's any probable cause that a, a child is being neglected, educationally neglected or what have you, all they have to do is take that proof to a circuit court to the judge and and have the homeschooling stopped. So, Kathy, as a, as a let's say as a, a new parent, I, I'm deciding to homeschool. What path do I take? Is there a choice of curriculums? What is the path to college for a homeschooler? Can you kind of give us the, 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 the basics of how somebody does it and how they do it successfully? Does, does that make yes. sense? So the curriculums out there are, uh, they're numerous. I mean. And you get to pick them as a parent? You get to pick what works best for your child as a parent, yes. Um, and that can be a, uh, a Christian curriculum, that can be a secular curriculum. It's up to you on what you're, what's going to work best is your, for your child. That can be books, that can be online, um, that can be hands-on, you name it. We, we were pretty eclectic in our homeschooling, so we did a little bit of everything over the years. And um, parents are able to, and they're able to change on, on a, on a, a pencil eraser head, so to speak. Uh, if something's not working, they can change immediately to something else that does work for their child. So everything is out there. And then they can gear it also as individually for each child. It's, it's like I say, it's the ultimate IEP um, that you would have in a public school system. So it's an individualized education plan for each child. So if you have a child, say they're in third grade, but maybe they're only reading on a, a second grade level, but they're doing math on maybe a sixth grade level, you can choose your reading to be on that second grade level, your math to be on a sixth grade level. Maybe they're doing social studies on that third grade level, but English is on a fifth grade level. You can choose all of those different levels to best suit the child. And we all know that every child is different. Every child has strengths and weaknesses. And you can work within those to help your child succeed and, and love learning. And that's the ultimate goal is you want your child to love learning because I know all of us as adults, we can look back and you probably don't remember much from school, but you have continued, you, you continue learning when something interests you or something you want to do and you pursue that and you want to put that love of learning in a child so when they have an interest or something they want to do that they learn how to, they know how to learn. It's not just, well, no one ever taught me that. No. I know where to go to find this information. I know how to learn. And they learn it and they move on and continue on. And those that want to go to college, you know, you look at what the colleges require and then you gear everything toward that. You make sure that they have all the classes they need. Our kids go to college. They, they get promise scholarship, everything else. Um, 
so everything is there for them. So, and Kathy, just, quick quick question here. Do you know uh-huh. what percentage, or, or maybe that's not on the homeschool side, what percentage of parents who homeschool um, actually turn in those assessments every year? Or is that something for the local boards of education to keep track of um, uh, in order to to maintain, you know, the integrity of, of the homeschooling program? Right. So that is something that the local boards are supposed to keep up with, and they they just don't. You I had a big had win with, uh, with some emails, didn't you? Uh, email addresses, can you explain that? Yes. So we, I've always told parents to send everything certified signature return receipt. That gives the parents proof that they've turned it in and that they know it's been delivered to the Board of Education. Um, some of the counties have allowed email addresses to be used, but the problem with that is there was always turnover. So I might tell you, you know, email it to superintendent such and such at this email address for this county, but without knowing it, that superintendent is no longer there. And now that email address is lost in the black hole of emails and never makes it to where it's supposed to. And the same with attendance directors. So I've asked for about a year and a half, maybe a little longer, for an email address to be set up across every county that was basically the same and we finally just got that um they just set it up about maybe two weeks ago and um now now parents could email to that one and then the people who are supposed to be in charge of homeschooling and attendance and everything will check those emails specifically and that way if it changes and those people are replaced or they move on to another position or whatever, whoever is in the position to take care of the homeschoolers and the attendants and such will have access to this email address so these emails don't get lost. But, but, so that has just been implemented. But going back to Maria's question, I've heard numbers as much as 70% of the submissions that should have been made are not being made. That's the numbers and from the State Board of Education. I think it's a flat-out lie. But that's from the um, State I Board can, of Education. They, and they say and they I have numbers to back you, it up. They don't have numbers because I've had parents just in the last week that have been from at least three different counties and multiple parents per county have been sent letters that they have not turned in whatever assessment year was supposed to be turned in. And the parents have proof that they turned it in and the school board has lost it. So Kathy, what county last year lost every single one? Which county did that? Canal County. Canal County. So lost every single one. So yeah. So this I, I keep coming back to the word defensive and because this this whole thing smacks me more and more of the taking a defensive posture. If there is a this problem that between you and the State Board of Education, why can't you sit around the table and get it resolved? What's the right number? Well, we have resolved we've got the law there. We have it in the law and we have always left it in the law that they can take anyone to court to remove their ability to homeschool at any time that they want to. And we have never tried to remove that part out of the law. We want the school boards to have that ability. But the reason we want it taken to court is because this is, this is a right of parents. This is a right. So if you are going to lose a right, you should be judged by a judge and a jury. Should, should that judge be circuit court or sh- could it be a magistrate? You and I have had that conversation off air. I think, uh, and I've, I've, should, spoke, I've spoke to a few people about this. I think it should be circuit court because in that case, it would it would have a jury available. Right. Now, I think, I think within the law, they can still take a possibly truancy type issue or a problem with assessment straight to the magistrate court right. and get that taken care of if need be and say, you know, hey, you don't get these things in, then we are going to escalate it to 
circuit to court. Circ- and I think that's where the, the loophole or the bad actors give everybody the bad name is, is a bad parent who has a truant child can right now pull them out, put them in homeschool for the last six weeks of, six weeks of school, and then just put them back into school the next year, correct? I mean, the, those, are the, those are the issues that are affecting all of the homeschoolers with a very small percentage doing that, correct? Correct. And, and given there are those that pull out for truancy issues that, that are very legitimate. You've got a kid in school who's maybe being bullied and you can't get them to go to school. It's one issue after another. Every time they go to school, they're being bullied to the point that they're now sick constantly so maybe they are truant the school's not doing any giving any help they're not they're not doing anything to the person that's bullying they're not separating the kids they're still leaving them in classrooms together whatever may be going on and then the parents at their last straw they don't know what else to do and they find out oh wait there is another way and that's a lot of times when parents pull out when their child's truant is because of a bullying issue or maybe their child is extremely sick, missing a lot of school. So there are legitimate reasons that maybe a parent pulls out when a child is truant. Mm -hmm. Now, are there parents that pull out when a child is truant just because they don't feel like making them get up or making them go? That's always out there too. And that can be taken care of. It's in the law. If the superintendent doesn't think that the parent should be or there's a problem, they can take it on to the circuit court and say, you know, here's the reasons why. Right. So, Kathy, what are the um, do you have any stats of uh, how many homeschoolers within West Virginia go to college or is is that not the uh, litmus test? I mean, I, I, I know we have a lot of. Um, Blue collar work in, in West Virginia, but is it a is it a larger percent, smaller percent? What's the the goal of a home? I do not have those stats. I know across the U.S., homeschoolers usually outperform on standardized testing. A higher percentage do go to college, um, so I do not have those stats. Uh, like my son, he did not go to college when he graduated, but he's in a career long job already and, and there's no west virginia homeschooler association where you, you go to get your curriculum or you, your answers for how you do these things it's really individualized correct it's individualized now we do have <coughs> west virginia home educators we have christian home educators we have several support groups like i said mine on facebook has over twelve thousand members um And we give the support and direction, okay, this is how you do things. Here's the curriculums that are out there. Like I said, I've even wrote a book, and it has a a way of getting started, uh, different curriculum ideas to get started with um, until parents can figure out, okay, maybe this is the best route to go. Maybe we'll switch over to this curriculum. And the curriculums that are out there and available are are in the thousands. Well, and I think, Kathy, um, some of our listeners have talked about, um, you know, what it was like to homeschool, if you will, during COVID. I mean, obviously, kids were going to class online, but what about that whole certification piece? Like, I could probably handle up to maybe about third grade, but once we get into physics and biology and algebra, oh boy, um, what about that, the higher levels? And unfortunately, we only got about 60 seconds left, Kathy. So. Well, I can say as a parent, you're the one that loves your child. You want your child to succeed. You will find a way. There are classes out there. There's online classes. There's, there's schools. There are tutoring available. You name it, it's out there. And then our kids are also able to take college classes or go to the local high school, maybe for that physics class, and take just the physics class. So... It is all available out there. There's no holding back and there's no need to have any type of certification. Kathy, I want to thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'd look forward to talking to you about this. I hope we don't see a uh, large attack on on homeschooling in the the next session. Um, But I thank you for your time. Appreciate it. 
Happy to. Anytime, Mike. You all have a great day. Thank you, Bill Thank and Mike. You. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Bill and Marie. I appreciate it.